so um, I'm going to talk. We're going to. I'm going to speak about Jesus and the Samaritan woman this morning from John chapter four, and see if I can get this to work. Here we go. The the woman at the well, John chapter four verses five through forty two. We're not going to read that all. It's quite a long passage, but hopefully you're familiar with it. You can certainly turn there. Feel free to turn there. And also you can, you know, look at the verses as I'm talking about them. Thanks, Jared. He's so smart. Um, So we'll just read a few verses just to kind of get us in sync with the passage here. Verse 5, so Jesus came to to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground which Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat by the well. It was about the sixth hour, which would have been noon. A woman of Samaria came to Jesus, or came to draw water. Jesus said, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman, <clears throat> then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink? A Samaritan woman. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, And who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Well, let's pray now, and we'll stop there for now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray as you open up your word, that your Holy Spirit would would illuminate it to us, and uh, just touch our hearts this morning, and draw us closer to you, closer to you in um, in a relationship to you, and and being obedient to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, the story of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, is a, life, is a story of the life-transforming power of Jesus Christ. Um, perhaps you've experienced yourself this life-transforming power. I, I trust that you all have. I know I have, and uh, I hope that you have too. Now, this past Friday night, we showed the Jesus Revolution movie here outdoors, and most of you were, were there. And uh, we had a pretty good turnout, and we saw a movie about the life-transforming power of Jesus Christ, right? We saw that revival occurred in that period of time in the late 60s, early 70s in California. And we understand, basically, from the uh, article that the Time Magazine wrote about the Jesus Revolution, actually, they called it the Jesus Revolution. They described that it was moving across the country. It just wasn't in California. We saw that even those people that were portrayed in the movie didn't know it was, it was so, such a widespread movement. So we saw the life-transforming power of God in probably what could, has been called the biggest revival in United States history. And we also saw the personal stories of um, Greg Laurie and his, what, what would be his future wife, uh, Kathy, how when they were teenagers they were both involved in the drug culture and the, the Lord reached them and they experienced that life-transforming power of Jesus Christ and went on to have a tremendous ministry in speaking to uh, it's Greg Glory. It was predicted in the movie where Lonnie Frisbee said, I, I see you speaking to thousands of people, and that certainly came true. He's, he's been uh, quite a pastor as a church of 14,000 people. And I understand uh, he has a church in, he pastors a church in Maui too, and of course they had those fires there this week. And I, th- I understand my wife was telling me she was reading where his, what, his, the church there was destroyed in the fire. So we should be praying for all those people there. Obviously a big, a very tragic event. Many people lost their lives. Um, so as we begin our story today, our passage today from the Bible, we see that the, Jesus and his disciples are traveling through the region of Samaria. They didn't avoid it like some Jews did because, and you know that I'll talk about a little bit later, the strife between the Jews and the Samaritans, but they went through it. They went through the region and came near to the city of Sychar, and Jake, Jacob's well was there, so there's some good Jewish history there. Um, obviously, you know, Jacob was one of the patriarchs of the Jewish faith, and you can read the Old Testament and learn more about Jacob. And so Jesus was there, and he sat down by the well to rest. It was noon. It was probably hot. I'm sure they'd been walking for a while. Now, his disciples had went away to buy food, so Jesus was alone there. And a woman of Samaria came to draw water from the well. And this, of course, was a common practice of the day, right? Um, has anybody ever drawn water from a well? Anybody? So 
Oh, you have, okay. Hopefully you didn't have to do that to get drinking water, but. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're blessed today to live in a country or an area that has uh, indoor plumbing, as we like to say, and, uh, and I looked it up, and that only came about in the late 1800s. And I'm sure it wasn't quite widespread then, so uh, it hasn't been that long, really, and it's really a nice, uh, nice uh, convenience to have, so we should be thankful for that. But they didn't have that, so they had to draw, they had to go to the well to draw water. And um, this, this, this woman, the woman of Samaria, was about to have a meeting with the creator of the universe, uh, the one who, who was and who is and who is to come. So it's a, it's a big moment in her life, and her life would be changed forever. And hopefully, like I said, we've all experienced that life-transforming power of meeting the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can all have that. Now, Jesus asked her for a drink of water. I think we read that verse. Yes, we did. And this, now this would be out of the social norm for the day. First of all, a man speaking to a woman who he wasn't related to, or um, you know, they weren't married, they weren't related. That's kind of uncommon right there. But then the fact that Jesus was a Jew and she's a Samaritan, Jews had no dealings with Samaritans, and um, Jews considered the Samaritans half-breed Jews and generally hated them, and the feeling was mutual. Uh, they had different religious practices. Basically, they didn't get along and, and avoided one another. Like I said, um, some people, some Jewish people didn't even like to travel through Samaria. They'd rather walk around Samaria and, and take more time if they were traveling somewhere than they actually go through Samaria because they just despise them so much. And we'll see that more as we go through. So after Jesus asked her for a drink, um, the woman responded by asking how a Jew would ask a drink from a Samaritan woman. And I just explained why that would be kind of out of the norm. Uh, but Jesus wastes no time getting to the point of his meeting with her. Let's uh, maybe, I don't know where I stopped, so I'll, I'll just read a little more. Uh, Jesus said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then will you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well his, as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks this water will thirst again. Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but that water that I shall give him shall become a fountain of living water springing up into everlasting life. So Jesus um, introduced, gets right to the point and says that she can ask for living water. Well, what did he mean by this living water? Kind of an unusual term. We don't think of water as living, right? We think of plants as living, and animals, we're, we're living. Um, but, and this is the first time this, ver, this term is used in the Bible. It's not really used that often. Also, it's used in John chapter 7 when Jesus talks about living water there, when he's at one of the, one of the festivals, one of the feasts. And we learn quite specifically in John chapter 7 that the living water is referring to the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit, which we, you know that those who receive Christ as Savior receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit actually comes in our life and indwells us. What a blessing that is. Jesus explains to her that if we drink regular water, regular old water from the well, we'll thirst again and we'll want more water. We all know this, right? We've all experienced that. But if we drink of the living water that Jesus gives, that, that person will never thirst again and it becomes a fountain of water springing up into eternal life, right? What a wonderful blessing that is. Uh, when, you play, when we place our trust in Christ for salvation, we, we receive the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, we'll have that living water, and we'll really have found the meaning of life. It really is the meaning of life. Your searching soul will have found the answer that you were looking for, and you will be satisfied. So you won't need that. You know, need to drink from that fountain again in the sense of being satisfied f for what your soul was longing for. More of anything that this world has to offer will not satisfy that hole in your heart. Now, I've been reading this book, um, kind of a different book, Lenin. This is about musicians. Lenin, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus, the spiritual biography of rock and roll. And it's written by Greg Laurie. And it talks about uh, how generally the book is about how rock and roll stars obviously become rich and famous. They can have anything they want. 
and they basically get into drugs and the whole scene, and they come to the end of themselves, and some of them have found Jesus. So I'm going to read you a couple short, short passages here. One is about Lou Graham. Anybody ever, ever heard of Lou Graham? Okay, foreigner. He's from Rochester. So and Rochester does get mentioned in the book, so another reason you might want to read it. Um, so lead singer Lou Graham has one of the greatest voices in rock music, but that didn't keep him from going down the predictable rabbit hole of rock, ex, rocks ex, bah, of rock excess. During Foreigner's heyday in the late 70s and early 80s, drugs were a natural part of the scene, but they were changing Lou for the worse, and he knew it. Life on the road, partying late into the night, and not getting enough sleep started to fray his nerves. He said that in the late 1980s through the early 90s, he was doing some spiritual shopping. One night in a hotel room, he had a revelation of how this would all end for him. I saw the possibility of my own demise. It was in this huge, posh hotel room that I got down on my knees asking for God's help to heal me and help me to rid myself of this horrible addiction. I just started praying because I knew there wasn't anybody in the world who could help me. Um, the, someone who was interviewing him named Ross asked him if he had asked Jesus Christ to come into his life. It de I definitely did because that's what I wanted for a long time and it was the option that he was offering me. So that was uh, Lou Graham and then there's also passage about Alice Cooper. Anybody ever heard of Alice Cooper? So it's a man, not a woman. <laughs> and um, he apparently was raised in, a, in, I can't remember if it was his father or grandfather was a pastor, raised in a Christian home and he obviously got off into the wrong, wrong way there and with, with his fame that he had from the rock music. But he says, it says here, the prodigal son had returned home and allowed himself to be embraced by his fast approaching father, he heavenly father once again. He says, I got to a point where I was tired of this life. I knew who Jesus Christ was and I was denying him because I was living my own life and I was living my life without him, Alice said. I knew there had come to a point where I either accepted Christ and started living that life, or if I died in this world, I was in a lot of trouble. And that's what really motivated me. When the Lord opens your eyes and you suddenly realize who you are and who he is, it's a whole different world. So he followed Christ in baptism, and he's a devoted Christian. And I just heard that he just played in Syracuse uh, last, last week. So you can still see him. He's still out there. So... Um, so really, again, these rock stars had, had it all, right? They had everything, the fame, the fortune, the popularity, um, and yet, you know, they, they, in the end, they, they found the answer in Christ. And so a lot of times as, you know, human beings, we search for something meaningful in life, right? And a lot of times we think that's, well, if I, if I just have a, if I make more money, I'll be, I'll be happy, I'll be satisfied. Or if I was just a little more popular, or I wish I was a little more athletic, I wish I was a football player like Josh Allen, or maybe not, maybe, maybe a different football. I know Grant would rather be uh, Aaron Rodgers, but. <laughs> you know, if, if we only had that thing that, that, we're, that we're missing, you know, yeah, we feel like we would be happy. But we know as Christians that's not true, right? We know that the answer is in Jesus Christ, and have a relationship with him. He is the meaning of life. Uh, if you receive Christ as Savior, again, you will never thirst again. And the Holy Spirit will always be inside you, as, we, as I read there about this, the um, fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. We have this spring. It's not like a one-time thing. This, this spring is constantly within us. The Holy Spirit was, is within us, and we need to you know, let that Spirit control our life and spring up and show us that God loves us, right? And, show, and teach us how to live for him. It's an interesting life, all right? It's, it's not just we live in la-la land, think, oh, I'm a Christian, yay, I'm going to heaven. But it's an interesting life. We, we learn things about God, very interesting things that stimulate us intellectually. When we learn you know, our, our faults and our sins and, and the ways that displease God, and we can improve ourselves and become a better person, a more loving person, a kinder person, and experience joy that only Christ can offer. So it's not just, uh, okay, I'm a Christian now and everything's going to be wonderful. Hey, we experience the tough times too, but Jesus is there in the tough times. Um, in Romans 8, 16, it says, The Spirit himself bears witness with us, with our spirit. In other words, tells our spirit that we are children of God. We have the Holy Spirit 
speaking to us in a silent way, right, usually, um, that, that he loves us, and that's the fountain that, that's inside of us. So the first truth that I have for, oh, I did, no, okay, got to get used to this thing. Uh, Jesus gives us the living water, which is a source of eternal life, so we have that. Now in verse 15, we read that the woman asked for this water. I'll read it. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus says, Go call your husband. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus says, You have said well, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one with whom you are now is not your husband, and that you spoke truly. And the woman said, I see, Sir, I perceive you are that, are, that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know, we know that what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So, again, in verse 15, we see the woman ask for this water. However, you can tell by the way she asks, right? Um, she doesn't really understand what the living water is. She still thinks it's something you might actually drink. So Jesus um, changes the course of the conversation here. He asks her about her husband, and she answers she has no husband, and Jesus, as, as you, we just read, tells her that she's had five husbands. And he, this is something that... Uh, Jesus wouldn't have known unless he was God, right? This was kind of like a, a way to show, Jesus' way to show her there was something different about him, right? A lot of times he would heal somebody or he would feed 5,000 people or walk on water. Well, with her, it was just telling her something about herself that she, he wouldn't have known, which kind of opens up the door for her to say, hey, what is it about this man that's different, right? Like most people w would, who met the Lord we're asking the same question. So, so the woman's starting to understand there's something different about the man she's speaking with. So she says in verse 19, I perceive that you're a prophet. And I think, um, again, she thinks he's a prophet because of the things that he said to her. So now in verse uh, 20, so she says, I perceive you are a prophet. So instead of going, I think right here now, she goes kind of in the wrong direction, which a lot of times happens when people are meeting the Lord and finding out things about the Lord because it makes them a little bit uncomfortable, right? And we, we all have probably experienced it ourselves personally and also with others. So the woman, what she does here is she brings up a, relig a religious issue that divided the Jews and the Gentiles, or I'm sorry, the Jews and the Samaritans. Remember I talked about that a minute ago, that the Jews and Samaritans were a divided people. They did not get along. And in this instance, it was a religious issue that had to do with the place of worship, right? The Jews, the Samaritans worshiped on this mountain, and the Jews say you ought to worship in Jerusalem. Um, and so this is a very common thing when people are confronted with Jesus and starting to learn about Jesus. They bring up religious issues, and, and it's not maybe intentionally that they're doing this to distract from the conversation. It's just something on their mind and it's something on, on her mind, but unfortunately, there's really, it's not helpful normally uh, to help people to understand who Jesus is, although you might have to get over that hump to get through it, uh, but sometimes it's a roadblock, right? And we all understand this, I think. But anyway, it's a common thing to bring up religious issue to, to dist and it distracts. Well, in my church, you know, we do things this way, and I was raised to believe this or that. And what I would say to that personally is just come to Jesus come to Jesus he is calling you he wants you to be his and uh, just put aside your religion and just think about Jesus and who he is because uh, Jesus is a personal God he is not a religion he is not a new set of rules to follow he is our creator and he, we were designed to have a personal relationship with him and it kind of came out this morning in the first meeting which, which uh, you know, it was a blessing, I, I think, to all who were there. Um, so my advice to, to you is don't worry about religion. Don't worry about what others think of you. Don't worry about um, what you may be losing if you become a Christian, right? Because having the love of Jesus in your life is better. I came to Jesus when I was 22 years old, 
and I've, I've never looked back. Um, when I came to Jesus, a lot of, you know, I lost friends, and, but look at all these new friends I have. <laughs> and I have, I have many more <laughs> in other churches. <laughs> But and a lot of people said, as I said, I became, you know, Mark became religious. He got religion, right? And it's funny because I don't actually like the word um, religion or religious. It's I'd rather the word spiritual or personal relationship with God. And so in preparation for this message, I started looking for, well, what's the definition of religion? I guess it's, it's a little harder to find than you might think, but this is one, I, one that I did find. Um, religion is a system of rituals and activities connected to a supernatural component that impacts the adherence worldview. Well, that doesn't sound too exciting, doesn't it? Um, well, the problem with religion is that it focuses on following rules and people pleasing, right? And it doesn't focus so much on the love of God and holiness. Now, who are the most religious people in the New, Te- in the New Testament? Who, who were the religious? Who was the religious crowd? The, the Pharisees and the scribes, right? And um, yeah, there was never, there was probably never a more religious bunch of people. I mean, they had rules, they memorized the old, the, what we call the Old Testament, and they followed these rules very strictly, and even stoned people if they didn't follow them correctly. And uh, what did Jesus have to say about them? Well, let's, um, if I can find where I am here. <laughs> This is what Jesus said about the Jewish leaders of the day. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. So this doesn't sound too good. You don't want to be like that, do you? You don't want to be like a whitewashed wall. You look pretty on the inside, but on the outside for people to see, but on the inside there's nothing there, just a bunch of dead man's bones and decaying flesh. Not a, not a pretty thought. But back to our passage here in verse 21, Jesus responds by saying, well, there's change coming to the wor- world, right? The hour is coming. Right? He says there's going to be change. He, Jesus came to bring change. Um, and to the people of that day, and he says that, you know, there, the change is coming where it doesn't matter where you worship. And that's pretty radical statement at the time because the place of worship, as the woman just said, was very important to those people, the Samaritans and the Jews. They even were divided over it. Um, and if the Pharisees were there, they probably would have stoned Jesus for it or, or tried to stone him anyway. I don't think they would have gotten to stone him. But in verse 22, now in verse 22, Jesus also takes on this religious distraction question head on. Like I said, some t- in a you know, in the kindest, loving, most loving way possible, we need to deal with people's questions and with, with Scripture. And so he does this. He takes on the question and answers it directly and, of course, correctly. Tells her that basically that um, she doesn't have the answer. Right? She doesn't got it right. We worship the, uh, the, the salvation is of the Jews, and the Jews know what we worship. And he says this because it's true. It was true. The nation of Israel was, were God's chosen people, right? Um, they would be the line of, physical line of the Messiah. The Messiah was promised through the line of David, and um, the, the Messiah would come through that line that was written in their, in their scriptures. And the prophets would foretold of the Messiah, and that was written in their scriptures, and Jesus fulfilled all those. Um, and the Samaritans were, really were half-Jews because they did intermarry with foreigners, and those foreigners brought in false gods and false teachings. And so they didn't have the full revolution, revelation that the Jews had. But I'm sure Jesus said it in, in such a way that um, as, as best he could without offending her. Uh, now Jesus gets back to the initial point he made in his response, that the change is coming. In verses 23 and 24, he tells her the hour is coming, more specifically, that there will be a new way to worship. True worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. It won't matter where you worship, but will matter, what will matter is that you have the Holy Spirit and that you know the truth about the Christ and you've received him as Savior and you have the Holy Spirit. So what Jesus is doing here is bringing the discussion back around to the living waters, right? He introduced the living waters right in the opening. 
kind of mm -hmm. caught our attention with that. And the living waters, as I said, is the Holy Spirit. So now he's bringing it back around to the Holy Spirit. Um, and and the, 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 those who worship the Father must worship in spirit and in truth. So I have my second point here. Those who worship God must worship him in spirit and truth. In other words, you really can't worship God if you don't have the Holy Spirit, right? If you don't know the truth, receive Christ as Savior, and have the Holy Spirit. Oh, we can go to church, we can sing songs, we can participate in the rituals, give our money. Uh, but if you're not really one of, one of the Lord's, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, then you're not really, you can't really worship him. You're not one of his, and, but you can be if you receive him as Savior. And then we're going to get, get right to another point here. You're probably wondering, man, how many points does he have? I didn't tell you, did I? <laughs> More. Uh, the Father desires to have a personal relationship with, with us. I don't want to miss this in this section, too. Um, it says the Father, in verse 23 at the end there, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. He's seeking. Let's not, let's not uh, forget about that. Jesus, who represents the Father, sought out the Samaritan woman. Right? He sought her out. He knew, I mean, this was no chance meeting. If you watch The Chosen, you kind of got a good sense of that. Um, but, you know, he knew that he would be left alone there. He knew that woman would come out. This, this meeting was planned before the foundation of the world, right? And, and so he sought out the Samaritan woman. And remember, she came alone to the well at noon. Now, that would have been, think about it, Going to the well to get water was something everybody had to do. And it was probably, you know, people say it was a time of like a social thing, right? You, everybody would go out to get water, kind of help each other out, have a time of you know, talking with people and visiting with your neighbors. And, yet, and of course, it would be something, remember, this is hot here too, right? It's not like Rochester. <laughs> this is more like Phoenix. I was looking at Phoenix today, it's about 100 something degrees today, 100 in the teens, 100 in the teens. And um, so it was hot. So typically people wouldn't do this kind of work at, at noon, right? They would go early in the morning, I, I would say, to, where it was a little cooler. So this, what, what does this show us? That this woman, because of her sinful lifestyle, especially in that day, was an, out, was an outcast and people didn't want to associate with her. And so she was alone, going out in the heat of the day to get the water. Um, and, but yet, there was Jesus to meet her, right? Jesus was seeking her, even though she was an outcast and others didn't want to so, so associate with her. And he seeks everyone, right? The Father seeks, as it says, he seeks such to worship him. He is seeking all of us, right? He says, Whoever, whosoever will may come. Right? Jesus is calling. He, we need to respond. He wants us. He desires us. We read in the letter from Peter that, um, that God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Now, repentance is kind of a big word. We, you might say, what does that mean? Well, in this context, it means to change your mind about Jesus. Whatever you were thinking about Jesus before, uh, and, you, and if, when you hear the truth about him, that, that he died on the cross for your sin, and that you could receive him as your Savior by praying and asking for forgiveness and asking for the gift of eternal life, and forgetting about all your pre your wrong ideas about Jesus, namely that you can the biggest one that I we uh, I run into when I talk to people about the Lord is that they feel that they can earn their way to heaven by doing good works, or at least they hope they can. And of course, this is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we that salvation is a gift, and that we don't have to earn it. And it's just like any other gift. You just take it, receive it, and it's yours. And you could go to Jesus and ask him for this gift of salvation, and he'll give it to you. And so he's seeking you. And so we read um, also in um, Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 through 38, Jesus says, Come to me, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble. And I'm gentle of heart. There's God saying he's humble and gentle of heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and, I, and the burden I give you is light. So if you're in this world, this world is not easy. Even as Christians, it's right, it's not always easy. We go through tough times, and 
people who aren't Christians go through tough times. Things don't go well right in their life. There's illness, there's divorce, there's problems with family, money problems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but Jesus says, come to me. If you're weary with these heavy burdens, I'm here to help you. And as Christians, he's here to help us through those problems. And if you're not a Christian, you're listening here today, maybe online, or maybe you're here and you're not a Christian, um, come to Jesus, right? He can help you through those hard times. Now, as I was saying before, the woman could have been very offended by what Jesus said, but she wasn't. And I'm sure uh, they had to wait. that had to do with the way Jesus explained things to her. Because he had just told her the Samaritans have it wrong. But to her credit, she wants to find out more about this, new, this person she met today. Um, so in verse 25, she changes the subject from worship to the coming of the Messiah. She says, I haven't read that yet. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he co- comes, he will tell us all things. So um, she may have heard about, so it's good that she jumped there. It's kind of a, a, it's a big leap. And good that she did that. And I think possibly she could have heard about John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist was baptizing in, in the wilderness in the Jordan River and preaching the, the, the Messiah was coming to prepare the way for the Lord. He's kind of breaking up the hard ground. And this might have been part of what happened here with her, that she might have heard about this going on. He says, hey, there's something going on here. Is the Messiah coming? We're waiting for the Messiah. So even, even though they were Samaritans and they didn't have the same truth that the Jews had, they did no, she says, I know the Messiah is coming. So they did have the concept of the Messiah. So credit to the Samaritans for keeping that in their teaching. And so she may have heard about John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness. So maybe she was just starting to put two and two together. Hey, there's this John the Baptist preaching about the Messiah. Here's this man telling me about things he shouldn't have known. It's kind of like a miracle. And he's teaching me all these spiritual things and about these new truths that are going to soon be coming, Um, maybe I'll just put it out there. Well, I know the Messiah is coming, and he'll teach us about these things. And I I, kind of think she was fishing a little bit to see what Jesus would say. You know, if if you go back to here, she never really asks a question, right? She always just puts out these statements. So uh, it's interesting the way she she does that. Um, So anyway... Jesus responds, he says, yes, I who speak to you am he. He says, I am the Messiah. So I think that one didn't get in here somehow. (laughs) Oh, here it is. Jesus is the Messiah sent to save the world from from their sins. I gotta gotta use this PowerPoint more often because it confuses me. Jesus is the Messiah sent to save the world from, from, from our sins. So he says, I who speak to you. And he, so he tells her outright that he is the Messiah. And of course, we know that the Messiah is the promised one from the Old Testament. And I spoke about that a little bit. The prophet, they prophes- prophesied about the Messiah that he would come and he would suffer and die for the sins of the people and he would rise again. And that's what Jesus did, right? He suffered and died and he rose again in fulfillment of the Old Testament scripture. So he is the long-awaited Messiah. So, um, we don't read any more. As far as we know, that conversation ended. Probably didn't, but that's all that's in there. Uh, the narrative changes now to the disciples returning. And the woman in verse 28, we read, she went back to the city and started telling people immediately about Jesus. And then these people that she told came out to see Jesus. And, and then if we read in verse 39, I'll just read in verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified he told me that all that I ever did. And so when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there three days, and many more believed. So basically the woman was an evangelist. She told others about Christ and what Christ had done for her, and many more believed. So the mission accomplished, right? The, the, the um, gospel, the good news about Jesus being the Messiah was brought to the Samaritans. So my last point today is we need to tell others about Jesus, right? That's our job, to tell others about Jesus. And the Samaritan woman certainly is a good example of that. Now, we had the Jesus Revolution movie last night, and, you know, it was a pretty good turnout, but I think we would have been okay if there were more people there and more new, pe- new people there. And I think there were some new people there, and that's encouraging. 
And so let's pray for them. We know that they heard the message through the movie and through Pastor Greg Laurie speaking at the end of the movie, sharing the gospel. And um, so we need, you know, just keep praying for the, for the seed to take root, I guess. Um, and of course, I always think, well, one of the things we did, if nothing else, some of us, many of us had conversations with people when we invited them to the movie, right? And told them a little bit about the Lord or just told them about the movie and how Jesus was working in that time period. And maybe they'll watch the movie on Netflix, right, or, or somewhere else. So, so um, let, let's not, you know, it, you, can, you can be a little discouraged about it, but, but that's the way it is, right? Um, I think, <laughs> you know, I would, let me just get into the past, and I think I'll, you'll see what some of these things I'm thinking. So just briefly, of course, this would be, could be a whole different sermon, but... Jesus, is, Jesus uses the opportunity here to teach a lesson to the disciples about telling others about Jesus. Because here's the disciples. You know, they went into the city to buy food. They're probably like, you know, I, let me out of here. You know, these Samaritans are getting, I'm getting the dust of Samaria on my nice clothes. I, I got to get out of here before I get contaminated. I mean, they weren't, they weren't thinking about witnessing. All they were thinking about is who, who gave them food? Where did he get food from? So this was a lesson. And Jesus says to them, look, my food is to do the will of him who sent me, verse 34, and to finish his work, right? It's about the mission. Uh, do, not, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you have not labored, others have labored, and you have, uh, and you have entered into their labor. So first of all, the whole, what, is, what is Jesus talking about with the four months and then comes the harvest? I think what he's saying is, hey, you guys are pretty smart when it comes to the harvest, right? We live in a very agricultural society. Most of, most of you are farmers or fishermen, but even if you're fishermen, you know a lot about farming. And you know when the, you know, when it's, the crop is four months away, you know when it's time to harvest. And, and so you need to be a, a, like that when it comes to spiritual work and spiritual um, mission, right? You need to have that same wisdom about recognizing when the Holy Spirit's at work and recognizing when the Holy Spirit is, you know, wants to work through you and, and, and sharing and speaking up. Um, and he's saying, look, the, the, the fields are white for harvest, so I guess when a, white, when a, field, when a wheat field is ready to be harvested, the tips of the plants appear white. Hey, I don't know. Even though I live out in the farm, <laughs> out in the country, I don't know these things. I don't pay it too much attention. I was raised in, in the city. And these, I don't really notice too much. It's interesting when Lavinia and I go on a walk, she's more of a, a rural person than me. So she's always like, when we're walking out back and she'll talk about the corn and the weed and stuff. I'm like, oh yeah, really? Interesting. <laughs> so, but, but, um, but, but the point here, I think, is that t- talking about the prophets in the Old Testament, I mean, all this hundreds and thousands of years of the Old Testament, the prophecy and, and the coming of the Messiah, it's all leading up to this time here where Jesus is here. He's here. And these 12 disciples are part of it. And they're going to see a lot of good things happening that people from the Old Testament didn't necessarily get to see this spiritual blessing, God pouring out his spirit on all flesh. And right, You think about what's going to happen in the book of Acts, you know, the day of Pentecost, and how the disciples are going to experience that. And so they're going to sow, I'm sorry, they're going to reap where another person sowed, so they're going to benefit from all that sowing that someone did. And I, and I, and I come back to, to present day. <laughs> I just feel like, you know, we do sowing, and, and not a lot of reaping. So it could be it's kind of discouraging at times. But, and I know there's reaping too. So I know camp, people get saved at camp and, 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 and things. But, you know, we share our faith and it's not often that someone gets saved. And, but I guess the point is we need to keep, um, got to get the right word, sowing. Right, sowing is planting the seed, giving out the seed. We need to keep doing that even if we don't see the reaping. It's not... It's not us. We don't cause the reaping. We can make the, do the sowing, but we can't cause the reaping. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And sometimes, all I can say is the time is right.
for it to happen. And sometimes it isn't. And it is discouraging. But uh, we have to keep doing the work. You know, I, I look at, uh, you know, I've, I think I shared, you know, not too long ago that they baptized 4,500 people at um, Pirate's Cove, right? That was in the movie Pirate's Cove where a lot of hippies got baptized. And so just about a month ago, they baptized 4,500 people there. Greg Laurie and his church did after their crusade, after they you know, had a two-day um, evangelistic crusade in, in Los Angeles. And then just a week before that, another group, big group of churches got together, and they had um, a baptism, and like 44,000 people got baptized. I'm like, wow, man, <laughs> I should live in California. <laughs> Apparently the Spirit of God is really working there. But... Um, but I also, you know, Lavinia and I were talking about it, and Lavinia said, you know, it's, there has to be a lot of sowing, right? For, I mean, people just don't necessarily walk into, say, oh, I'm going to go to hear Greg Laurie speak, because I've never heard of Christianity before, I've never heard of the Bible before, I've never heard of Greg Laurie before, I've never heard of a church before, but I'm going to go to this crusade and listen to him speak. No, there's, there's been a lot of sowing going on, right? There's been a lot of people you know, talking about, maybe talking about the Lord with them or inviting them to church or sharing things with them. So a lot of, a lot of stuff built up to that. So we, so we have to take courage, to be, be encouraged by that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together once again. Thank you for the encouragement of the scriptures. Thank you that we had a chance to share um, through, the, through the movie and invite people this, this, uh, this past week and we pray that that would bear fruit someday. There would be some reaping down the line, Lord. And also for camp, we think of the souls that have been saved there this, this year already, this summer. And also we, we pray that it will happen again this, this week. And um, we pray for those souls that were saved, that they would just grow in you and be, come to a nice church and make Christian friends and just have fellowship and teaching. And also, Lord, for this, the, the seed that was sown that didn't bear fruit yet, Lord, we pray that the reaping would occur down the line sometime. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.